If you woke up in a house being filled with poison gas and were told to follow a trapped treasure hunt to find the antidotes, what would you do? In this How To Beat video, we'll follow Jigsaw's latest victims, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the traps in Saw 2. Think you can do better? Let us know in the comments. Enjoy these How To Beat videos? Like and subscribe. Have a movie you'd like me to cover? Reply to this comment. If you haven't seen my video on Saw 1, go check it out and see how all of this pain and suffering in this sequel could have been prevented. This video's sponsor is Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is a mythical RPG world packed with fearsome champions, all from their own unique factions which have deep intertwined lore. Sounds cool? Check the game out by using my link below to download Raid on mobile or PC. Want to hear more about the badass champions you'll be commanding? Meet the Banner Lords. The Banner Lords are basically medieval knights and are one of the few completely human factions in Teleria. They believe themselves to be on the side of good, but the orcs, ogren, skinwalkers, and Lizardmen would disagree. The lands of the Banner Lords were taken from the non-humans by force, and kept through centuries of persecution with the help of the Sacred Order. Now, with the Banner Lords weakened by wars of their king, it may be time for them to right an ancient wrong. At the front of the line, we have Lord Champfort, leading his men into battle with the Tower Shield and Giant Poleaxe. Coming around the flank is Killian the Lucky, leading the cavalry with his giant green lance. Sneaking up on the enemy's rear and cutting their throats is Alarak the Hooded. I'd say these humans are not to be underestimated. There's lots of new content and things to do that came out this month. They're releasing 11 new champions and almost 200 brand new missions, with an exclusive legendary champion as your reward if you manage to finish them all. They also added 5 challenging levels to almost every single dungeon in the game. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the links, and support my channel by downloading Raid Shadow Legends today. Alright, let's see if we can outsmart Jigsaw and his traps again. We start out following a guy named Michael. His name isn't important because he probably won't be with us for very long. Michael cranks the standing mirror over to see why his eye hurts so f much. The results are inconclusive, but it's definitely not a sty. The TV turns on and an evil Dr. Phil tells him that his career as a police informant is over, unless he proves himself worthy. The rules of the game are as follows. The device around your neck is a death mask. If you do not locate the key in time, the mask will close. Think of it like a Venus flytrap. The funny thing about the key he needs is that it's located in the clear jelly-like core of his eyeball. This takes the phrase, snitches get stitches, to an entirely new level. Man, this makes Amanda seem lucky. She got to scalpel someone else. Michael has to scalpel himself. Jigsaw doesn't provide a demonstration for this trap, but I think it's pretty clear what will happen when this nail-filled mask slams shut. Michael's first course of action is to scream for help, which beautifully reverberates around the concrete basement he's in in. The wire attached to his head contraption isn't helping the claustrophobic feeling of being in here, so he yanks it off. Unfortunately, this triggered the spring-loaded clock. Based on the ticking sound, he's got 60 seconds. You can make cupcake baking stressful by adding a timer. This guy's head is inside a nail-filled Venus flytrap with seconds before it closes. He better be able to think clearly under stress. The first thing he sees is a little box on the ground next to him, which has a scalpel in it. You could take the scalpel as a bad sign or cringe at the thought of slitting your eyeball open like a pokeball. But at least you have the scalpel. It could be worse. Jigsaw could have left him with nothing and forced him to dig his fingers into his eye socket and rip his eyeball out to get the key. Michael can't muster up the nerve to dig through his eye before the time runs out and his game ends. Let's rewind and see what Michael could have done to beat this trap without performing surgery on himself. Right off the bat, he shouldn't have yanked the wire out, which initiated the countdown and caused his stress levels to go nuclear. I think this is a reasonable error he could have avoided. When Jigsaw was talking about the spring-loaded timer on his death mask, Michael had felt around and located a circular device with a glass face which was attached to the wire. He could have also confirmed this by using the mirror. It's not a stretch to think that in order for a spring-loaded timer to be activated, something holding the spring loaded has to be removed. It should have been obvious that it was the wired pin inserted into the timer. The next move would be to try to figure out a way to dismantle the pulley system which could pull the wire and set the trap off. 
even with the trigger disarmed, you'd still want to get the bear trap off your head in case it was set off somehow. Using the mirror and feeling around, he'd see that his head contraption was mounted on a leather harness with a waistband and shoulder straps secured by padlocks. The device looks like a single piece design that was slipped over his head. What also makes me think that is that the key he needs to find unlocks the padlocks on his harness, not the device. He could use the scalpel to cut the straps and lift the device off over his head. If Michael had pulled the pin and started the timer by accident, I still think he could have cut the leather straps off in time to slip the device off before it snapped shut. If I'm wrong and it is a two-piece design that was tightly fitted around his neck and couldn't be lifted off, well then that sucks, especially if he's on the clock. His only option besides getting the key is to jam the device by either shoving the flimsy toolbox in between the levers by his neck or put the metal stool over his head. Bear traps can exert up to 1,000 pounds of pressure, so I'd go with the stool and not the thin metal box. Michael circumventing this trap by jamming it or cutting himself loose might not be enough to beat it if he's locked into a concrete cell. Jigsaw usually requires his victims to sacrifice their pound of flesh in order to be freed, so the door may not be opened for him until he obtains the key. Digging through his vitreous humor to find the key to the door is still a last ditch move. I'd try to wait a few days before putting myself under the knife in hopes that someone found me. Turns out this was a good call. Michael's body was found by County Asbestos Cleaners a day or so later. Detective Allison Carey is the lead on the case, but she brings Detective Eric Matthews in because Michael was his informant. Or I should say, they think the body was his informant, based on the writings on the ceiling and the videotapes. Let me get a look at his face, I'll tell you in two seconds if it's him or not. Therein lies the problem. Eric is able to identify the body as his informant based on a tattoo, so Allison pries further to see if he has any idea who would be capable of engineering all this. Eric's no Jim Gordon. He's completely unmotivated to take on this case with the backdrop of his crumbling family life, even after being called out by Jigsaw himself. Back at the police station, Allison's reviewing the tapes trying to find clues. She's not very good at her job, so she ropes Eric in to take Jigsaw's bait in hopes that she can catch a lead off of it. Look, I'm no Detective, but does following a serial killer's clues ever really help you? They wouldn't have given you a clue if they thought it'd lead to them getting caught. Eric wakes up in the middle of the night when he's suddenly hit with the realization that Michael's device had the logo of the abandoned Wilson Steel factory on it. Obvious bait, but Eric thinks he's more clever than he actually is and calls Allison with the news. Allison should know from investigating Jigsaw's previous victims that he isn't stupid and wouldn't leave clues out like this unless he wanted them to show up at the factory and play another one of his games. What would I do if I was Allison? Not go into the factory. Has Allison already forgotten what happened to Detective Tap and Sing? Besides being dangerous as hell, you're just playing into his hand. I would get the blueprint for the factory and stake out all the exits. Jigsaw wants us to run into his funhouse. He wants us to play his game. By playing hard to get, Jigsaw might emerge from hiding in order to tempt our attention again. Again, Allison's a shitty detective with no lead so far, so she's perfectly fine letting Eric walk right into a trap. Hey, at least they got a warrant and called in a SWAT team instead of bum rushing in like Detective Tap and Singh did in Saw 1. The SWAT team makes entry, but as expected, the factory is trapped. The other SWAT operators apparently didn't hear the buzzing sound of the metal fencing being electrified, or thought it was just the sound of the lights. The rest of the SWAT team pushes through to the second floor and finds Jigsaw doodling out some new trap designs while eating Cheerios. They cuff him up and Eric rolls in to drop his one-liner that he was practicing on the drive over. Is this close enough? This just shows Eric's naivety and why he shouldn't be on the case. When taking down the evil mastermind is this easy and they're that calm when apprehended, you should be wondering how you're getting played instead of getting cocky. Jigsaw tells Eric that instead of going straight to a jail cell, he'll hang out here while Eric deals with the problem in the room across from them. Right about now, it should be hitting them that they fucked up coming here. The SWAT team captain tosses a pipe to the fencing to make sure it's not electrified, which is a good call considering what happened earlier. Eric and Allison enter and uncover a bunch of monitors displaying Jigsaw's latest victims in a trap. One of those victims is Daniel, Eric's son. It's about two hours. 
before the gas creeping into his nervous system begins to break down his body tissue. What happened to the United States does not negotiate with terrorists. Throw this demented cancer patient in a hole and throw away the hole. He thinks he has leverage because he thinks he can get you to play his game. Villains like Jigsaw orchestrate their escapes by throwing victims at the police as distractions. The way to end it is by not negotiating. You just take the L on those victims and eliminate the target. It's not the most political move, but it stops the shit dead in its tracks and heavily disincentivizes future terrorists because it's no longer an effective strategy. It's like John Wick dome shotting Santino in the Continental. If Allison wanted to take the trophy home on the Jigsaw case, this is the out of the box thinking that Jigsaw would not expect what Whatsoever. Of course, she'd have to take charge and pull Eric off the case ASAP before Jigsaw got Eric too emotionally invested because in this situation, taking the L on the victims means his son might die. Eric calls his son's phone number and Jigsaw tells him to leave a message after the beep. Yep, it's confirmed, his son's in deep shit. But everyone needs to take a deep breath here. Jigsaw's trying to get everyone tilted. Let's think this through. From Allison's investigation of all of Jigsaw's previous cases, she would know that he often speaks with loaded phrases that are more literal than they seem. So Eric needs to be relaying everything he hears Jigsaw say to Allison, especially things like this. He's in a safe place. This completely contradicts what he just said moments earlier, about Daniel having two hours before the poisonous gas breaks his tissue down and floods his lungs with blood. The two hours thing is bothering me for another reason too. Jigsaw says that he hasn't checked the monitors in a bit, but he thinks that they have about two hours left before they're dead. This is a tight timeline, too tight. I don't really buy that Jigsaw put the victims in there and timed the police arrival perfectly so that there was two hours remaining before the gas killed the victims. He even put a clock in there with two hours counting down. If Eric hadn't had his revelation quickly enough, hesitated a little, or the police just didn't gear up and make it to the factory as quickly as they did, the victims would all be dead and the metagame involving Eric wouldn't work. The counterpoints would be that Jigsaw had the gas flow on remote and triggered it when the police showed up or that he had help that triggered it when the police showed up to the factory. It does make sense that he had help. A late-stage cancer patient wouldn't be able to snare seven people and drag them into a trap room. These both still don't explain the incredibly coincidental timing of when they showed up to the factory and when the victims woke up, found the cassette tape, and started progressing through the trap. For all they know, this isn't real-time footage at all. They need to bring in a computer forensics team to start investigating the feed in the broadcasting location, which they do, as well as bring in a bomb squad team to help the SWAT team turn this factory inside out looking for anything useful, which they don't do. Apparently, everyone thinks that sitting on their asses watching Jigsaw's reality TV is gonna solve the case. Jigsaw tells Eric that he just wants to talk to him alone, which Eric reluctantly agrees to. He does sneak a radio in too so Allison can listen in. I want to play a game. What you have to do is sit here and talk to me. Then you will find your son in a safe and secure state. With Jigsaw in their custody, how could he possibly ensure the safety and security of Daniel by sitting here talking with Eric when Daniel's in a trapped house being filled with poison gas with six other desperate strangers? The most reasonable answer is he can't. Even if Jigsaw technically didn't specify whether Daniel would be dead or alive when returned, he still couldn't ensure that his corpse was in a safe and secure state. Based on the previous cases Allison is aware of, Jigsaw has honored the rules of the games he's created, even if he lies or double speaks about some aspects, and winning is an option. So if winning is an option for Eric, then technically the only way for Jigsaw to ensure the conditions and availability of the prize, aka Daniel, is to already have Daniel in a safe place somewhere. The fact that the time coordination between Eric and Daniel's game is highly implausible, and the outcome coordination of Daniel's game is near impossible, would make me very suspicious that this is pre-recorded footage. And the longer Daniel survives in the game on the monitor, the higher the probability that this is pre-recorded. They could also try to bluff Jigsaw by confronting him about how they know it's pre-recorded, that the screen feed is paused or stuck, that Daniel is dead and that they're taking him to jail now. Jigsaw can't see the monitors, so if he expressed that he knew anything, it'd be suspect. The interesting thing about this game is that Jigsaw is in police custody. If Eric puts on some Beethoven and kicks his feet up, Daniel will be returned to him and Jigsaw would go to jail. Seems like an outcome Jigsaw would want to avoid, but he might not care because he's almost dead, and whoever is helping him will continue 
his legacy. Still, not exactly a preferable way to go out, nor is it interesting. Jigsaw has demonstrated that he knows Eric's shady off the books tendencies. If I was Allison, I'd anticipate Jigsaw baiting Eric into doing something stupid to get his son back, which will entail wittingly or unwittingly helping Jigsaw escape. How could Eric possibly walk out of here with Jigsaw without them being able to follow? Well, if they paid attention, secured the blueprints for the building, and properly secured the area, they'd know that Jigsaw is sitting in a utility elevator right now. Convenient that he'd want to remain there for the duration of the game. I wouldn't bag Jigsaw right now, or let him know that I knew his plan. Daniel could still be anywhere, so we need Jigsaw to lead us to him. We start following the seven unlucky contestants in the trap house being filled with poison gas. Well, they don't know that yet. While they definitely aren't in jail, they are being held captive with the camera watching their movements. Daniel graciously points out that these types of cameras don't have sound. A woman named Amanda, who we're all familiar with, wakes up with a look of horror and panic on her face. She immediately starts running around checking every nook and cranny until she finds the infamous cassette recorder. Not exactly a subtle move on her part. Now everyone knows that she knows what's going on. She hits play on the cassette recorder. Three hours from now, the door to this house will open. Unfortunately, you only have two hours to live. Right now, you are breathing in the deadly nerve agent. He then goes on to say that several antidotes are hidden around the house, one of which is in a safe in this room. He says that they each have the combination numbers for the safe written in the back of their minds, In the order of the numbers can be found over the rainbow. I don't see any rainbows, but maybe there's a box of lucky charms with instructions inside. Jigsaw also says that once they realize what they have in common, they will better understand why they are here. For this clue, X marks the spot. Finding out what they have in common doesn't sound like a leads to an antidote, so this is a total waste of time. There's no point in covering your mouth with clothing or anything like that. Nerve gas vapor can permeate your skin, so clothing or a paper mask won't stop it. Amanda should know from helping Jigsaw set up traps and being a previous victim that his phrasing is loaded and often literal. She should be checking the back of their heads and necks for numbers. This is later revealed to be where Jigsaw hid the numbers. The vault only contains one antidote based on Jigsaw's message, so she needs to be secretive about collecting the other's numbers, and then she needs to get herself alone with the vaults so the others don't fight her for it. Amanda doesn't seem to have learned much from her time with Jigsaw. That or she's not actually a victim here. Xavier picks up a letter on the ground with a key attached to it. It says, do not attempt to use this key in the door to this room. Neglecting Amanda's warnings, Xavier tries to unlock the door with the key while Gus looks through the peephole. Okay, let's not break the rules from now on. This trap was odd. Why was the gun aimed through the peephole? It's extremely unlikely that someone would be looking through the peephole while they or someone else simultaneously unlocked the door. It would make more sense to aim the barrel of the gun through the doorknob so that the bullet was directed straight into the person trying to open it. The other victims start questioning Amanda as to how she knew about the rules, the tape and jigsaw. Amanda tells them that she's played one of his games before. Yeah, I neglect to mention that I was Jigsaw's apprentice too. Everyone buys her half of the story and starts turning the room inside out trying to find the key to the vault with no luck. The door to the room suddenly opens by itself. It appears to have been on a time delay. They all start dispersing through the house looking for clues, but the more intelligent victims are also grabbing weapons. These antidotes are sparse. Unless this herd gets thinned out a lot, there won't be enough for all of them. It should go without saying that they should be treading very lightly and using extreme caution when manipulating any objects, unless they want to end up like Gus. That means not fixing crooked picture frames. Jesus, dude, that's one of the most well-known types of booby traps out there. Xavier tries using the spiked bat to break down the door labeled exit, but it's metal reinforced. Gee, I'm shocked that the door labeled exit wasn't actually an exit. I do think Xavier has the right idea. He's just thinking a little too in the box. This is an entire house, not a tiny concrete room. I highly doubt the entire building is covered in metal barricades. It's more likely that they just covered the weak points like windows and doors. The seven of them with access to weapons and tools should be able to knock down a wall or break through the weaker ceilings within two hours. If they attempted this, they'd want to blind the cameras too just in case their captor was watching and decided to up the gas flow for breaking the rules. Laura finds a door leading down into the basement where they find another cassette tape stuck in a doll with a note for Abby. Inside the device in front of you are two antidotes. One is my gift to you 
for helping me kidnap the others. The second is yours to donate. However, one of them will come with a price. Well, Abby's dead. There is no way the others let him walk out of here after hearing that and Laura's witness testimony of Abby abducting her. Abby tries to save his own ass by volunteering to go into the furnace to get the needles, saying that he gets one if he makes it out. I know nobody wants to volunteer to go into an obviously trapped furnace, but putting two antidotes in the hands of the sociopath who kidnapped all of you isn't a good idea either. And really, if you don't get those antidotes, you're dead anyways. Jonas questions whether or not they should even be getting and sticking themselves with these needles, and up until now I'd have agreed with him, but with everyone starting to collapse and cough up blood, I don't think they have a choice. Before going in, they should check for gas lines and shut them if possible, jam the door open and have someone hold his feet ready to pull him out if shit goes south, as well as check for any additional engineering that was done to the furnace. They know from Gus and the peephole cannon that Jigsaw uses rather unsophisticated mechanics that they need to watch for, like this obvious pulley right next to the door that Abby completely misses. Again, I would not have sent the selfish bastard like Abby in, but since they did, they might as well ensure his safety so he brings back the antidotes. Abby finds the antidotes dangling from chains hanging on the ceiling of the furnace. When he goes to pull the second antidote, instead of carefully pulling the syringe from the chain, he just yanks the chain connected to the pulley and wire, which is connected to the door, which pulls it shut and ignites the furnace. God damn, this was so obvious, it hurts. But this was the same day dipshit who fixed the crooked picture frames in a booby-trapped house. So what do you expect? There's a nozzle across the flames that says twist me, which based on the tapes is a method for extinguishing the flames. Obby's too much of a bitch to take the hit and twist the nozzle, so he goes up in flames along with the antidotes. The others break the back window and Abby manages to squeeze his head and arm through, but it's too late. Abby's dust and ashes from the neck down. They check to see if that was the hand holding the needles, but nope. To be fair to Abby, the antidotes were not ranking high on the priority list at the time. Everyone's really starting to succumb to the effects by now. They've already burned away an hour and still haven't gotten any antidotes. Xavier and the others find a semi-stuck door and try to force their way in. I swear, the nerve gas must be affecting their vision, because I don't know how they don't see the pulley and wire right above the door. He forces it open, pulling the pin on the clock on the door across the room, which shows four minutes counting down. Muscles runs over and tries to open the metal vault door with his bare hands. This guy's the living embodiment of the saying, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Jonas finds the cassette tape with Xavier's name on it, pops it into the cassette recorder. I'll give you just one hint as to where that key is. After finishing the tape and realizing their mission, they only have two minutes left to find the key in the needle stack. Jigsaw wants us to jump in and start hand digging for it, which is a terrible method. Shuffling the needles around is far too slow. I'd have two people with shoes grab the crate and baby carriage and start bucketing out the needles. By dispersing the needles over a greater area and removing them from the pool, others can more easily sift through them and check for the key. Meanwhile, another two people can use the spiked bat and shovel that Amanda was previously holding the fish around. This chain gang isn't in a cooperative, team-first mindset. Xavier grabs Amanda and throws her into the pit of needles, presumably because she was a junkie and would be the most comfortable in the situation. Ah! Fucking mind. Hurry up! Ah! Everyone's yelling at him for being an asshole, which he is, but at least he acted. None of you bitches were doing anything. Once Amanda gets past the initial shock factor, she starts scrambling around and miraculously finds the key, which conveniently has a glow tube attached to it for visibility. She tosses it to Xavier, who fumbles the key at the 10 yard line, causing the door to be locked, the antidote to be lost, and all Amanda's work to be in vain. They've lost every antidote so far. Their time's running out, and their chance of securing more antidotes is slim. Even if they get another antidote, it's not enough for all of them. It's time for plan B, which is busting through the wall. Xavier, of all people, correctly guesses the solution to the number riddle. I'd have guessed that the combo had something to do with them all being prisoners, like their cell or inmate numbers. Nope, Jigsaw just sharpied the number on the back of their necks. Gus has a red number two on his neck. Now he just has to get everyone else's number. Jonas wants to to help, but with only one antidote in the vault and Xavier's test rage kicking in, peace was never an option. Jonas has some moves, but not enough to keep him alive. <laughs> 
Jonas's number is a yellow 16. Xavier's lucky that Abi popped his head out of the furnace, but even if Abi turned to ashes, he might still be able to brute force the last number in time. Abi's number is a green 11. For Xavier's sake, I hope he's writing these down. The others are oblivious to this and still trying to find clues. As Laura chokes to death on her vomit, she points out the X crack in a glass picture frame. Behind it is a picture of Daniel with his dad, the man who put them all in prison with planted evidence. As expected, nobody really cares too much. It's not like Jigsaw hid an antidote inside Daniel. Addison decided that she couldn't trust them, so she braves the new trap room by herself. There's a plexiglass box hanging from the ceiling with two holes in the bottom and an antidote inside. There's also a note with a cassette tape but she doesn't have the player, so she won't be getting any hints. Addison's immediate action is shoving her hands into the box's holes without any inspection, testing, or caution. Never stick your hands in unfamiliar holes. That's just common sense and general life advice. She should have used the foot of the wooden chair behind her to stick into the hole to test it, or just visually checked it from the top and bottom. Then she could use the stick to keep the blades up while she carefully pulled the antidote out from the plunger side. Once her hand is inside the box, she tries to grab the antidote, but tugged on the capsule which separated it from the plunger and released the contents. Another antidote down the drain. When she tries to pull her hand out, the blades cinch in and trap her wrist. I think she could squeeze her other hand into the same hole and push the blades up with her fingers to free her hand. If it's too tight, maybe she could shove her belt up into it or something. Addison's not the smartest tool in the shed, so she shoves her other hand into the hole to grab the empty syringe capsule. Must be the poison affecting her. Writhing is just gonna make things worse. She might be able to shove her arms in further and hold up the opposing side's blades to get one arm free, and then get her remaining arm free using the methods we already mentioned. But yeah, at this point, she's pretty stuck. She doesn't realize Xavier's on a murdering rampage yet, so from her POV, calling for help is probably the best option. Xavier arrives with no intention of helping and pulls her hair back to get her number. Amanda discovers Jonas's caved-in skull and hears Xavier yelling to find them. He's already hell-bent on killing them, but Daniel dropping the picture sure as shit didn't help. In Xavier's chase, he finds Laura's body and collects her number two. Amanda and Daniel wedge the door shut against Xavier. It seems like they're stuck until Amanda finds a secret basement door. They escape through it and wind up in a dead end, which also happens to be the bathroom from Saw 1. Adam didn't age too well, nor did Zepp or Lawrence's foot. Xavier chases them down, but before he kills them for their numbers, Amanda hits him with a big Q. How will he get his own number? This distracts Xavier into cutting his neck skin off to get it, which opens an opportunity for Daniel to saw his carotid artery open. <laughs> That was the same saw that Lawrence used on his foot. Nasty. Xavier really should have killed them before the self-surgery. Side note, Xavier made it pretty damn far without dying from the poison. Dude was a tank. Amanda and Daniel, on the other hand, never showed any symptoms. I don't think a nerve gas was being pumped in. I think everyone was poisoned except Amanda and Daniel, which makes sense. Daniel has to live for Eric's metagame to work. Amanda not being poisoned, however, is extremely suspicious. Back in the factory, Eric loses his mind watching all this go down and tries to beat his son's location out of Jigsaw. Allison, this is what Jigsaw wants. Why haven't you talked any sense into Eric? Again, the fact that Daniel is still alive means that the probability of this being pre-recorded is very high. Otherwise, Jigsaw's metagame falls apart. Jigsaw says game over, and that'll take Eric to Daniel on the condition that nobody follows them. And there it is, Jigsaw's brilliant escape plan. Eric hits the elevator button, which takes them to the underground garage where his getaway car is parked. Allison was just completely gobsmacked by this wholly unpredictable move. There was just no way of anticipating that Jigsaw had an escape plan or could have known he was sitting in an elevator. Eric should have grabbed the radio before leaving so he could let the SWAT team know his location after Jigsaw spills the beans. Right after their escape, the tech team gets a lock on the location the broadcast was originating from. Jigsaw leads Eric to the house and Eric hops out and heads inside without taking literally any precautions. Again, he should have brought the radio, or used his cell phone to call in his location now that he arrived. He should have cuffed Jigsaw to the car, kneecapped, or killed him right there. Why Eric, in all his rage, didn't kill Jigsaw once they arrived is beyond me. I get that Eric thinks that he's on a time crunch, but waiting 5-10 to 10 minutes for SWAT to get there seems reasonable given the danger Jigsaw's trap houses pose. The 
police show up to the house where the broadcast was originating from. Except it's not the house the victims were in, or the one that Jigsaw led Eric to. It was a proxy house that was serving up old footage. The timer hits zero and buzzes open a vault in the corner of the room. Inside is little Daniel breathing through a mask. I'm going to assume that he didn't make a peep this whole time because he was breathing in sleeping gas until the timer hit zero. Still, nobody checked what the countdown timer was hooked up to? Are the bomb and geek squad they brought in really that fucking incompetent? Eric makes his way down to the basement where Xavier's body has been rotting for days. If only he brought his radio or someone called him with the news that Daniel was safe. It looks like there's someone in the tub in the back of the bathroom. In his approach, he stupidly holsters his weapon and gets within jump scare distance. Why? Just why? Eric's stupidity finally catches up with him. What is with pig mask abducting people with the worst strategy imaginable? You're going to hide in a tub in the trap house that Eric thinks his son was murdered with dead bodies everywhere, with a pig uniform on, in hopes that he holsters his gun and gets close enough to you so you can stab him with a syringe. Eric wakes up chained to the wall with a cassette tape next to him. At this point, do you even need to listen to the tape? You have to realize you're an idiot who's completely fucked himself. He hits play and Amanda basically tells him it's game over and he's going to rot in the bathroom like like Adam. Game over. I'll fucking kill you! The movie ends with Jigsaw chuckling at the thought of Eric getting played like a fiddle. Let's recap the pivotal points where different decisions could have altered who lived and died. Breaking out of the house was an option in my opinion. Then they could all hit up the hospital and reveal the location of Jigsaw's base. Gus looking through the peephole was unnecessary and unlucky. He was always dead. Abby's death was entirely preventable and they could have secured two antidotes. Xavier not seeing the pulley above the stuck door was pretty dumb as well. They could have secured another antidote, leaving three in need. Addison's trap was also entirely beatable. That's another antidote. Xavier wouldn't have been so aggressive and desperate with all these antidotes, and with his brains, they would have secured one more antidote. If the detectives were not morons, they would have deduced that there was a high probability of the game being pre-recorded. Checked what the countdown timer was linked to, turned the factory inside out, got the blueprints to the factory, realized that Jigsaw was sitting in an elevator, and anticipated Jigsaw's game, which like involved an escape plan involving Eric. Jigsaw likely would not have been successful. If Eric had radioed in his location, the SWAT team would have raided the actual house, taken down Amanda and Jigsaw, and saved Eric's life. Even if Amanda fled, there's substantial evidence that points to her being connected with Jigsaw. Her being involved in surviving two games means she has recurring ties to him. Daniel's negative toxicology reports and Amanda surviving with him to the end without showing any symptoms is indicative that she wasn't poisoned either. And as a detective, you have to ask why. All said and done, I think we could have beaten the traps from Saw 2. Thanks for watching, and remember, be a good person and value each day you're alive, or you might end up in a psychopath's torture dungeon.